Welcome to the Dirty Side of Leadership podcast with Ron and Kristen, where leadership meets entertainment. This podcast features stories with names and certain aspects that have been changed to keep submissions private. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Dirty Side of Leadership podcast, where leadership meets entertainment. I'm your co-host, Kristen Sock, and I'm sitting here with co-host Ron Ward, best-selling author of the Dirty Side of Leadership book. Ron, this has been a long time in the making. Can you believe we're actually sitting here doing this? Finally, finally, I've been waiting a long time for this. Oh my gosh, me too. I mean, it's been about a year in the making when you appeared on my show as a guest. We knew that we needed to partner on something, some project. And and I'll tell you what, folks, I interview a guest a week and I've been doing this for two years and some guests you really vibe with, some not so much and you can't wait for the 27 minute segment to be over because you don't know what you're going to talk about. But with Ron, we vibed, we knew we needed a partner and here we are making it happen. This is exciting. Yeah, it really is. Um, yeah, I can give the history on how it happened. Um, I went it. on your show and then you called me and begged me to do a podcast and <laughs> I agreed. I'm such a nice in guy. In your dreams, <laughs> in your dreams. What's your... <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it quite happened that way, but uh, Ron did call me after we had the show air and he was like beating around the bush a bit. And I was like, okay, you want me to be a co-host? Let's do this. And so it was pretty funny. I knew where you were going with it. I was all in. I know what I want. I knew we would have magic between the two of us. No, no, it's really been it's really been awesome. And we have gotten to know each other during this interim period, which maybe is best. But um, I don't know. Tell them about uh, what we plan to do. Yeah, no, I'm excited. So the cool thing with what we're doing is Ron's book, the Dirty Side of Leadership book, there are 100 dirty lessons. And so not we're not going to only stick to those dirty lessons, but we are going to break down the dirty lessons and involve you as the listeners, as the viewers. That's really important for us to have involvement. We want to hear from you. We want to help you with any issues you may be experiencing as a leader or as an employee regarding your leader, anything under the business umbrella. And the cool thing is Ron and I, we come from private and public sectors. So we bring different backgrounds where I worked for a private company for 20 years as a bank leader and Ron has worked in more in government. And so very different backgrounds, but there are a lot of underlying similarities in leadership that we will be bringing to the table. Yeah, you said a few things. Uh, number one, I too am so excited about having listener participation. Uh, we started a Facebook group that uh, took off immediately and people are weighing in and giving leadership tips. And uh, of course, our title being Horrible Bosses, I think that generated a lot of attention. And also, you know, I'm on the East Coast and you're out um, some some other part of the United States. Um, <laughs> uh, we're on different time zones. We bring different backgrounds. And I do think it will be a unique combination. Uh, I'm going to teach you a little bit about the Appalachias and the coal fields and all that as we go. Uh, but, yeah, I'm I'm very excited. And, and I think our diversity will and our involving uh, listeners is going to make this podcast very unique. I agree. I agree. There's so many people that have something to say and they just don't have the platform to do it. So by us providing that, it's going to be magical. And you know, you mentioned where you're from. I live in Portland, Oregon. So you guys have probably seen us on the news quite a bit lately. Keep Portland weird. That's been a thing for decades. It's gotten really weird over the past three years. Uh, but I've been in leadership in the Portland area for 20 years, outside of one year when I moved to Manhattan and uh, worked in the Empire State Building. So that was a really cool experience that I will definitely be sharing because it was vastly different from what I've experienced working in the Pacific Northwest. But uh, we we bring so much to the table because we are from completely different regions, and that does make a huge different difference in, in how you lead your team. Yeah, and by the way, I didn't know about the Manhattan story. I, I'm anxious to hear that mm -hmm. as well. Uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about our differences. We also share a passion for leadership and all things leadership. And um, I think 
no one would argue that, especially post-pandemic and everything going on, that we need leaders. We need people to step up and lead. Uh, people are afraid. People are struggling. And uh, I hope that we can, you know, bring some humor, bring a bright spot to people's day, but also bring some information that you can actually use. We want to be solution-minded. And uh, we're going to have stories. We're going to have, as Kristen said, a dirty lesson uh, we're going to have maybe some quotes and things that uh, we've learned about. And also, we said where leadership meets entertainment, when I'm an avid podcast listener. And before Kristen and I even, I was on her show, I had, I'd started listening to a lot of leadership podcasts. And I do not mean this disrespectfully. And it's probably because I tell everyone, someone, some people have an oven type attitude. I have an air fryer or a microwave. Um, <laughs> I like that. So when I get to those leadership podcasts, it kind of starts this way. Um, why did you write your book? Tell us a little bit about yourself. And frankly, I've been on a bunch of podcasts and I almost cringe like that gets so old. And I'm not sure people care that much. So I usually fast forward up to the content. So what I was hoping, and then when I talked to Kristen, she was all over it, is that, you know, we kind of uh, skip some of that and uh, we get to the content. We uh, find Amen. ways to make things entertaining. And we do share listener stories, some of our own stories. And um, I just think we're going to have a really good time, Kristen. Yeah, we are. It's going to be great. I'm the same way. I'm like, I need to make this ADHD proof, right? Like, we all have a nanosecond of an attention span these days, and and so we don't really have time for the jargon. We just want to dive right into what matters and entertain you at the same time. So we both have a good sense of humor, and that is important to us. There's so much going on in the world today. We need to be able to laugh and have a good time while facing reality. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we need a sense of humor right now, for sure. I, I did want to say, though, uh, not to contradict my previous statement, but I want to tell their listeners a little bit about you, Kristen. 20 years of bank experience, a show host. It's very popular. You're a major social media influencer, which is really why I teamed up with you, so I could get all of your... <laughs> You're using <laughs> me for my followers. I'm using you. Um, and, but also, most recently, you were a campaign manager, and I'm sure you learned some leadership lessons in, in that arena, Oh, my goodness. Yes, that was a quick one. Talk about an air fryer. That was seven months um, that you know I ran the campaign and I was working for a politician who had been a state senator for 25 years and then went on to work for a presidential administration. I won't dive into who, but uh, worked directly for the president. So when I'm saying I'm a campaign manager, I'm a campaign manager for somebody who's very, very knowledgeable and has led at the highest level. So I went from being a director and having my own team and delegating to, wow, everything's delegated to me. So it was quite the eye opener. Um, and then I, it, it, it was tough. I'll be honest. It was tough. It was amazing because I learned so much in a short period of time, but it was very humbling because this individual was always three steps ahead. And and I strive to be that way. So it was incredible. And I can't wait to really break that down and um, and share it with the audience. No, I'm excited to hear about that. And I want to assure you, Kristen, I will not be three steps ahead. So uh, I'll probably be <laughs> three you. steps behind. Uh, so that should make uh, you feel better. Lockstep, yeah. please. Um, <laughs> I think... One of the cool things about this podcast, we're going to share stories, as I said, and, and I want to let our listeners know that there are some stories. I, I come from a law enforcement background. Um, before I retired, I was the academy director uh, for U.S. probation officers, which is a, a very unique career. But also, I've been an entrepreneur now since the end of 2020, and I've had an opportunity when I was doing research for my book, I spoke to leaders, CEOs, managers, government leaders, church leaders, and uh, I've been putting material together for, you know, quite some time in anticipation of this. But another thing about the unique parts of podcasts, we understand there's thousands of podcasts out there. And when I was trying to decide whether to write a book and now do a podcast, I thought back to a time and I want to tell this story at some point when I had to terminate an employee. 
And I realized that all of those trainings, all those podcasts, nothing prepared me for that moment. So I hope we can take steps. We're, we're going to pick on managers today, horrible bosses. But if you are a manager, a supervisor, and you're listening, we want to, number one, encourage you, help support you. We're also going to talk about terrible employees and things that you have to deal with. So we're trying to cover the whole gambit here. So keep that in mind as we go, because we are going to pick on bosses today. Right, Kristen? Yes, we are. And we chose Horrible Bosses for episode one for many reasons, but it seems to be something that everyone's experienced. And the sentiment that people don't leave jobs, they leave bosses, couldn't be more true, though there are instances where people are going off because they are going to be paid much better elsewhere or they want to work from home and their current job doesn't offer that. But a lot of times they are leaving because of a poor leader. And so that's something that is it's really evergreen. It's it hasn't changed. It's always going to be an issue. And so we want to dive into it, pick it apart a bit and bring you on the journey of let's laugh at some of the stories that we've had submitted to us, but then also provide those solutions. No, I love it. So, Krista, before we get into some stories, I, I've got one, and I, I think you got some stories as well. And then we had some submissions. And uh, I want to assure people that ordinarily our stories that are submitted, we will keep those private. We will change names and dates. We're not being dishonest. We're just protecting those people yeah. who submit uh, the stories. But we had a Facebook group and we've got a LinkedIn group, uh, the Dirty Side of Leadership group. And um, we had, I asked the people in the Facebook group to share one word uh, in regards to a terrible boss or a horrible boss. These are some of the words and maybe Kristen, we could go back and forth, maybe get your thoughts as well on these. Uh, the yeah. first one was a poser. What does, what does that speak to you? <laughs> Oh, like the fake it till you make it guy or gal. Yeah, exactly. The one what that's I, pretending to be hard and they're not. That's what I'm doing for this <laughs> podcast. I'm, um, <laughs> I love it. So I, I, I wanted to share a quick, this is a brief story, but I had someone who was trying to sell me something not long ago. And it's someone I'd known a little bit. And they said, how's your family? I'm talking about my family. They're literally reading their next line off the script so since I've been in leadership for a long time, I'm a lot more assertive than I used to be. And I said, hey, I did it this way. I said, hey, bud, you asked me about my family. You're not even listening. So if you don't care, don't ask. Um, I know that seems a little harsh, but I do. I, I wanted. Good for you. Yeah, I wanted that jolt. So this individual would not do that again. And I can always tell you have these genuine leaders who are empathetic and they're compassionate and they care. Then you have these leaders who take training and they're trying to do what the training told them to do. And they're like right. a, an empty suit. And uh, so I just, I felt like this person will never do that again. And sometimes we may be a little assertive on this uh, program or hard on people, but we want to be agents of change. We want to help people yes. change and improve. And I'm still working on me. Uh, so anyway, yes, you talk about never forgetting something. I want to share something that was a learning moment for me because I was a bank leader for the majority of my 20 year banking career. But in the very beginning, I was a banker. And I remember a woman, this has been burned in my brain. A woman came to me and she had just experienced where her purse was stolen and I needed to shut down accounts and replace debit cards and the gamut. And so when she presented it to me, I immediately went into solution mode I didn't take a deep breath and show the empathy. I went, okay, let's get it done. You know, like in my mind, I'm like, I'm doing what I need to do. But what she did is she mocked me. She went, okay, let's get it done. And then I, I was taken off. I'm like, wait, what did, what did I do wrong? And when I reflected and looked at her, I, I didn't take that moment to feel what she was feeling and to acknowledge how stressful it is to lose your purse, your wallet. And I have never done that again, ever. I've always taken that moment to feel what the customer, the client, the person is feeling and then move into solution mode. So I think sometimes those, as uncomfortable as that was at the moment, that has shaped how I lead and interact going forward. I love that story. And I think the vulnerability will serve people well. 
one time my daughter, my youngest daughter, came in and she had an issue. And of course, I wanted to spring into Coach Ron. And uh, she literally looked at me and she said, I need you to be a dad, not a coach. And I just put my arm around her and she wept, which she never does. I knew it was serious. And there are, there, there's times, uh, internal, external awareness, we have to read the situation and we have to have a level of compassion if we're going to be an effective leader. All right, let me give you, a, let's um, yeah. talk about a few other words. We won't spend that much time on these, but oppressor. And that's the person I describe as gets up and brushes their teeth and they formulate a plan of how they can make everyone miserable uh, for that day. I, I don't understand those people. Why are those people like that, Kristen? They're unhappy in their own lives. They don't have much going on. They are just depressed, anxious, uh, just unhappy. And I really, I've had to understand that I've had leaders like that. And I've had to really not take it personally and just say, they have nothing going on in life. This is it. And so generally, I have found that negative people don't like me because I'm not a negative person. So when I've had employees working for me or even a leader that really didn't appreciate my personality because I am upbeat and positive for the most part, I had to really look within. But then also generally what I came to is they're not a positive person. They're a negative cancerous personality and it's okay if they don't like me. So I think that unfortunately, generally it's, they're unhappy in life. I, I think that's so true. And those are the people who send you emails all weekend. I'm not saying they're all oppressors, but uh, they eat, sleep, and breathe their job. And they have no right. work-life balance or harmony, as a friend of mine says. And um, yeah, that's that's good information. By the way, if you're in management and you're listening, we do challenge you to challenge yourself and uh, try to improve as you hear these uh some of these tips that, you know, we're throwing out there. Yes, yes. So I want to, on the emails, I have to chime in sure. on this because I cannot stand when, okay, if you're, if you're out there sending emails on weekends or you're sending emails one in the morning, midnight, it's not impressing anybody. It actually makes you look like a loser who has no life or has absolutely no ability to balance your day to manage your time properly. So I think that I've definitely worked with people that I worked until one in the morning and they're online sending emails so that you see that timestamp and you go, wow, they're really dedicated. That is not generally what people are going to think about you. And think of the pressure it puts on the employee. They think they have to respond or if they don't respond, they're ignoring their boss. Like, uh, that that's, an, right. you know, unless war is breaking out, I, I usually yeah. discourage that. Um, yes, yes. It, no hair on fire emails. <laughs> right. It's like, take a breath. Right. If you're a leader, take a breath. Manage your emotions. Send it out during an appropriate time frame. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just a few more. Um, egotistical and narcissist, those two are probably related Um you know, that's the, the person that brags about how effective they are. And I'm going to tell a story in just a minute that will kind of align with that. Then the micromanager. And by the way, we I got micromanager uh, multiple times, uh, both in my DMs and uh, in the Facebook group. So apparently that one rings true. Uh, and then there's manipulative. And um, that's the people who put the guilt on you and just try to manipulate you. Um, and again, we're going to come to some stories, but then there's inconsistent. I've seen these people who, you know, they get motivated, they clean their office or whatever it is that they're going to start hydrating, drinking water, or working out. And then uh, I had a boss like that. They always had a big plan and it would last about a week and then they would go back to normal. You, <laughs> you know, like you'd have to condemn their office. It was so messy. Uh, Anything running through your brain on yeah. that, Kristen? And I'm laughing because it's like I, I know the personality type. Very, um, They probably lack the ability to filter. Um, yeah, yeah that, that is a real thing that I've experienced also. What it does, though, as much as it's humorous, because I'm just like visualizing the offices and the person like, 
I'm doing this. It breaks down. I have a family member like this, actually, where they're always, they always have this grand plan and you eventually just go, I'll believe it when I see it. Right. And so it really breaks down people's um, confidence in you as a person and, and as a leader um, and the trust factor also. It's like they just say, yeah, right. And roll their eyes at you after a while. Very true. Very true. Now, here's the the second most popular submission that we got, passive aggressive. So we had micromanagers and passive aggressive. Um, I, I do some funny things when I conduct leadership training, but I always use this line um, when someone, let's say a young couple bought a new house and someone says, oh, that's a good starter home. They're, they're, always, <laughs> they're always sending you those messages, those subliminals or... Uh, Again, exactly what it says is passive aggressive. I had um, yeah. one manager that worked for me would would just use, use sarcasm, um, you know, like someone wanted something, some information, and she would say, "Well, if you push the right button, the elevator stops on the right floor." <laughs> so it was like oh, metaphoric yeah. passive aggressive. Yeah, uh, it was it was funny. Speaking in riddles. Speaking oh, in that riddles. drives me nuts. Oh, another one was yeah. like if someone wanted to purchase something, it wasn't budget time. She would say, "Flowers only grow in the spring." <laughs> I have to be honest with you. She did make me laugh. <laughs> That's kind of funny. She made me laugh yeah. a lot. <laughs> but I did see staff being a little confused sometimes. Um, yeah. She yeah. had one other one, and this is really humorous. Uh, we, I was off, I think I was in Richmond, Virginia. I was with uh, my superiors in DC. So we're at this training and someone, uh, I'm sorry, she had to fill in for me. And um, so she's at the academy. We have a, a kind of a, a crisis, at least a minor crisis. So I call her because she sent me a text. Well, I put her on speaker immediately and I'm with my boss. She was in the military, so she loved to use military references. So I said, hey, what's going on? She said, oh, we're all asses and elbows down here. And uh, <laughs> I just, I just kind of looked at him and I said, and I told her, you know, you, you, we've got someone else on the phone here. So it was just really funny, those uh, military oh, metaphors. Love it, love oh, it. And then there's the insecure, which sometimes goes right along with micromanagers and narcissistic behaviors, arrogant, controlling so that's just some that we got. And um, Chris and I wanted to start off with a story that this person I wrote about in my book. Uh, I, I said working for an idiot, and uh, it ties in with uh, a dirty lesson that we have. And uh, it's interesting because the book publisher wanted me to remove that. But I wanted it to really strike a chord, so I left uh, working for an idiot. But I wanted to tell you a story. But I came up, as you said, my book has 100 dirty lessons, or DLs, that I call them. So DL number 36 is poor leaders can teach some great lessons. Keep a private journal on what not to do. And that certainly rings true. So we had someone who got promoted, and we were told there was some nepotism involved uh, there were multiple offices, but he basically got promoted to the head of headquarters and apparently was related to a judge. Now, I did not work directly in his office, but everyone in that office told us he was terrible. He was not a good officer, but he gets promoted to the top job. And he would spend in, in our initial conference calls, he would talk about how well he did the job and that we need to come up to his level. But those of us that knew him knew that, you know, we would have to take a step down to get to his level. Yeah. So anyway, shortly into his tenure, one of the officers had a heart attack, a very serious situation. So he calls a meeting in headquarters. So, you know, we're driving different directions. And uh, he told us that the three in my office, we had to drive separate vehicles. So we didn't know if we were turning a vehicle in. We weren't sure what's going on. But he brings us in and we're all wondering, what can we do to help? How's this person doing? Do we need to take up money? How's their family? The normal human questions that you would have. He walks in and he says, OK, the reason I called you up here, you know, so and so had a heart attack. And uh, I think they're going to be OK. But here's what we need to do. We need to get their work. We cannot let the work suffer. And so he started divvying out. He bragged on his executive team of how well they did to divide up this person's workload. And then he said, 
the reason you drove three vehicles is we have to keep mileage on our vehicles or we will have to turn those back into the state. I think it was 1,100 miles, <laughs> which is stuck in my brain. You don't use it, you lose it. Exactly. That's really what it was. <laughs> So here we are, and and I feel like I never support gossip. I think you have to, you know, avoid that. But I think he almost forced us to gossip because when we got back to my office, uh, by the way, this was before cell phones. Don't say a word, Kristen. Um, So (laughs) I I should have had walkie talkies. Um, If you're a young listener, that's a radio of some sort. Oh, so Lord. we get back to the our branch office, and of course we're having him for lunch. We're like, "Can you believe this guy? The nerve! He showed no empathy, no compassion, and he really did. He blew it in that moment. Even though yeah. he had already started off a little rough, I think if he'd have showed compassion, he could have kind of rallied a team. Let us talk. Yeah. How are you feeling about this? You know, there were people that worked right in that guy's office. He didn't even give them a chance to weigh in. So. Horrible bosses. Yeah, horribly inappropriate. Horribly inappropriate. Yeah. yeah, no, that's that's really bad. And, um, you know, I always I joke that I have half man brain because I definitely the empathy thing for me, it comes natural with with like with a, with my mothering. Right. Like I'm very empathetic to my kids, yada, yada. But um, I'm very solution oriented. And so I've even I'm not giving this guy an excuse at all. But I'm just stating there are those of us out there that go into solution mode and we have to check ourselves. And clearly he wasn't self-aware. That's something at least I'm aware of things I need to work on. Sounds like he's just wildly out there floating around in his own, you know, (laughs) in his own world, doesn't know how to interact. The sad part about this is the greatest thing happened for me. It's six months after he was promoted. I got hired by the feds. But I have to tell you, I felt so sorry for my coworkers that were stuck with him. And it turns out, because I stayed in touch with people, I don't remember the number. It was more than 10 left that career. And when you have a state law enforcement position, it's early retirement, good benefits. You don't just leave, especially right. to that number. And then I found out they basically promoted him to like a regional position where he didn't have to deal with line staff. He only had to deal with a few managers. But instead of actually terminating or getting rid of this guy, they promoted him. And I think that happens across the country. And I'm sure there's listeners shaking their heads that know stories like that. Yeah, I'm sure. And I do think it differs between like uh, private sector and public sector. I do think there is because my husband being a police officer here in Oregon, he tells me things and I'm like, wow, in the private sector, they'd be fired. (laughs) Like immediately or, you know, things like what you just mentioned, people don't leave those jobs. You have that pension after X amount of years. Right. And so in the public sector, you don't have that necessarily. And so you can just go to another bank. Right. If you don't like what's going on. But it makes if you have a horrible boss and you're in a position where you have a pension at the end or you have a retirement plan, it makes it very your life very hellish because you can't it's not like you can just go bounce and and go somewhere else. Um, and so that's why, you know, podcasts like ours is is really important for not only the employer, but the employees to be able to hear and feel like they have a voice. Yeah, no kidding. So, Kristen, you got a story for us? Yes, I do have a story going way back to when I was 15 years old, my very first job. Really, what this story is about is a lack of managerial courage. So my mom got me the job. She was a buyer at Nordstrom for a long time. I was at Nordstrom sorting hangers. There are 19 different hangers that Nordstrom uses. So I was sorting these hangers in the basement. Not a great job at all. But I was able to listen to the radio and just zone out doing my thing. So I lasted about nine months in this job. And I ended up leaving. But here's here's what happened that really ticked me off. I came in one day. And my boss had taken my radio and left a note that said something to the effect of, took your radio or I have your radio, something like that. It really frustrated me for a number of reasons. But here's here's the main one. I didn't know why he had taken my radio. Was it because he didn't think that I was sorting hangers fast enough? Did he have a, a reason? Did he think I was distracted? Did people up on the sales floor hear my radio? I don't know. I have no idea. To this day, I have no idea. 
But basically, I was left to sit in the basement, sorting hangers, listening to my tinnitus. And and that's it, right? So that could drive anyone insane. And the whole thing is, this could have been avoided if he would have just said, hey, Kristen, I need you to step up production or turn the volume down. People on the sales floor can hear it. That didn't happen. And so that happens in, in jobs, in serious jobs. That was just my little first job. But even in the most recent job I've experienced, I've had a complete lack of managerial courage when it comes to a difficult message. And it's if it's a difficult message for them, one, I don't really struggle with those, but a lot of leaders do struggle with a difficult message. And instead of actually having that conversation, they avoid it um, by taking a radio and leaving a note, right? So it's one of those things that's really frustrating and a lot of people need to be self-aware and realize you have to have the courage to have difficult conversations. And there are ways to do it to where it's not that tough to be on the receiving end. Wow. That is a, that's a great story. Number one, we told you this podcast would be informative. We know how many racks or hangers that Nordstrom has. Uh, <laughs> yes, also, I think some, one of our listeners <laughs> needs to contact headquarters and find out why Kristen's radio was taken. Number two. I still want to know. I think we need that to find what, that out. 20... Uh, no. <laughs> long, and and this ago. is a shameless plug, Krista, but, but in the leadership training uh, that I conduct, it, I have courage building exercises, but we run scenario based training and I call it making uncomfortable conversations more comfortable. So we put people in actual scenarios so that they have to provide corrective feedback. And I've had so many wonderful stories from that, but you're right. Uh, especially if you're a, a, a good person in general, I think there's some people enjoy giving negative feedback and that's more the narcissist personality, but I think it is a challenge. And I do know that when I got promoted, if you would have gauged my leadership then, I was definitely not as assertive. And then once you get beat up a little bit and you go through some things, you get more comfortable with it and you're able to provide feedback uh, in a more, you know, I'm not saying that you're, you're, you don't want to be aggressive, but you can definitely be more assertive and you can build that courage level. And uh, so. Right. And I'm pretty sure you just called me a narcissist, I, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, here's the thing. I I can handle these tough conversations because I do it well and I make sure I am regarding the person on the other side. But it is an art form. I Which tell is you. exactly you what to, a narcissist would it. say. Just kidding. <laughs> Only kidding. Maybe. <laughs> so I said we had some listener uh, submissions and I've got uh, two or three that I'm just going to summarize quickly. Uh, this came from my buddy, Nick. Uh, this individual got promoted. He was, Nick was in sales. He was on the road. So this individual, of course, when you spend the night somewhere, you got to turn in your hotel receipts. That's common knowledge. But this particular manager would make him go to a restaurant near the hotel, eat breakfast, get a receipt, and to show that he actually spent the night at the hotel. Um, he would also call him first thing in the morning at starting time and five minutes before quit time. But my first question was, did you do something to destroy trust here? You know, I got to make sure that there's not a reason because I have had to micromanage for yeah. some brief periods. But he assured me that he didn't, that this was just the way this individual did business. And can you imagine that is treating your employee like a child? And this individual was obviously insecure, paranoid, or whatever. And many times people who micromanage, they think in their mind, they're holding the company together. But what when they erode the trust of their employees, ultimately it affects morale and it's ultimately going to affect the mission. So uh, I thought that was a pretty extreme micromanaging story for sure. There's a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a lot a to lot unpack. There. I really <laughs> want to, yeah, there's a lot to unpack. Uh, I don't think we're going to have all the answers on really why that that leader cared that much about where he ate, where yada, yada. But but yeah, I mean, micromanagement, that is my least favorite character trait. Um, I agree with you, though, Ron. There are times where you've had numerous conversations with an employee and they are not improving. And that is when you do have to move into micromanaging. But there are plenty of employers that just micromanage. That is their MO. And they've never been given a reason to do it. 
they just do it. And I, I always go back to that insecurity. I really feel that when you have leaders that are that way, they are wildly insecure and they overcompensate by having their thumb on you on every move you make. And really, it's destroying the culture because when you hire a leader, you want them to have the mentality that they are running their own business. Their department is their sole proprietor, their business. When you have your thumb on them to where they can't be the creator, make leadership decisions on their own, when you're looking over their shoulder, you actually, I want to say something. Have you ever had someone watch you type? You make mistakes. Someone's over your shoulder and you're typing something. That's when you do typos. Happens all the time. People get nervous. They don't want somebody watching them constantly. And so when you do that, you are just killing off that person's ability to lead and they become a foot soldier, which is probably what they want. They probably exactly. want someone that they say jump, they say how high, and that's a whole other issue. That's But insecurity and personal problems lead to micromanaging for no reason. Yeah, I think we, we share the same belief on micromanagement. Uh, again, uh, if you're a manager listening, as Kristen said, there are employees who put themselves in situations to be micromanaged, and I hope no one does that that's yes. listening. But when it is your MO, it's the way you conduct business, you need to do some introspection. There's something is missing there. And uh, so also, you know, I think from micromanagement to passive aggressive, there are leaders who they, they're really weird. They're just odd. Um, I had one submission and I'm not going to go too much into detail on this one, but um this individual, there was a staff member who became terminally ill, breast cancer, terrible story. And this leader not only got insecure, told um, the individual that did the submission was friends with the person that had breast cancer. So naturally, you're going to share information with your friend that you may not share with your boss. But the boss got jealous and did not like the fact that this one employee was sharing information with the other employee and not the management team. But I'm sure the person with breast cancer had no confidence or trust in the management team. So not only did this manager, who was a female, manipulate circumstances and situations and, and express a jealousy, but at one point they had an office gathering and they had just found out that the cancer was terminal. This executive pulled the individual that made the submission and said, do not share any information. I do not want you to ruin my office gathering, said my wow. office gathering. So this individual, uh, of course, was demoralized. She was told not to share the information that was earth shaking for her. Uh, she didn't receive any empathy, just you better keep your mouth shut. Then it went on to the funeral. This individual actually spoke and bragged, made herself into a hero of how she was there and she supported this person and she did this and that and, and the staff wants to throw up. So I think some of these behaviors, if they're unchecked, they get even worse. And we know that, you know, a lot of onboarding uh, processes. Even when people get, they step into a management role, there needs to be a secondary onboarding for that. There needs to be training. But I think that there is a real lack of mentors. And in onboarding, and even ours, uh, when I was academy director, a lot of it was, can you do X, Y, and Z? In other words, it was a knowledge-based onboarding. Right. It was to help you gain a skill but not necessarily to help you gain leadership skills. And that's where we need mentors to actually speak to the situation. Like, yes, you, you have this information, but what do you do with it and why? I always, one of the lessons in my books uh, or in my leadership course, same, shameless plug, is uh, you may be right, but are you right? And mm. sometimes you may be right in a situation but you don't need to let the other person know. Or maybe there's a timing involved. Maybe it's just not the right time to say, I told you so. So there is a right. lot of dynamics to leadership, and it's never just cut and dry. It's about understanding personalities and knowing your staff, knowing when to deliver a message. And these things, 
uh, a lot of times can be improved with a good mentor, a good feedback process at work. So uh, I hope that, you know, listeners in these situations can begin to pair people up, get somebody who's really excels at their job and excels at leadership to help others who need it. Yeah, no, seriously, there's, there are so many, I know I received ample stories as well. Those two are next level, Ron, (laughs) you've got some people are dealing with some stuff that you know, right now. But um, there are number of stories that just you really you feel like am I listening to an office episode, right? That's one of my favorite TV shows, The Office. And it's humorous because, well, Luckily, you're not living in that works that work area. That's not your office. You can laugh at it because that's not your manager, right, Michael? But um, when you were talking about these leaders, I think that is something Michael would do in the office. And he's this crazy, horrible leader, as funny as he is as a character. Wow, would that be a nightmare to actually have a leader like that? And there are leaders. There are leaders out there like that. Um, so there's plenty of resources. We we will bring you to the resources on on how to improve yourself and how to improve your works your work situation if you're working under somebody like that. Yeah, I think we could do 20 podcast episodes on just stories, and and I'm sure we will revisit yeah. some of these things. Last one, and uh, I want us to go into some solutions. But I had a friend Phil who uh, literally was sent emails this. I guess would go more toward passive aggressive, but he had a boss. He went through his performance evaluation, which was fine. Never received negative feedback. The boss sent terrible information via email to the executive uh, about Phil. And he had no idea that the guy felt that way. So someone actually sent Phil the email in the executive office. So he actually saw it. So you can only imagine, and he has copies that, you know, he said he would give to me. Maybe we'll, you know, make it scandalous and read that uh, (laughs) at some point. That's the entertainment factor. That's the entertainment factor. We will talk about some (laughs) entertainment. But, uh, Kristen, how do you you feel about that? I mean, he didn't even tell him anything. No, it's bad. And so one of the things that I'm really passionate about is when people get annual and quarterly reviews, there should be no surprises. You should be meeting with your leader often enough to where you know exactly what you need to be working on. You know where your strengths lie and you know where your weaknesses are and your areas of opportunity are, are being not only discussed and brought up by your leader, but then you're taking steps towards them, tangible steps towards them. So when people go in, and this happens all too often, people go in and they are having the review done and they are completely surprised and shocked by what is being brought up. That is a complete failure by your leader because you should always know where you stand, good or bad, you should know where you stand. And so what the passive aggressive management style does is it breaks down the trust because when you're whacked over the head with a poor review, when you have never once been um, had anything brought up to you, like I need you to do better on communications, um, if that's never been brought up to you, but then you go into a review and you're told that you have poor communication style, that is unacceptable. So you should have enough communication to where you could pretty much fill out your own Uh, quarterly annual review and know exactly what your leader is going to put because you've had these conversations. So I think nothing breaks down trust faster than that type of scenario. I love it. In my uh, book and training programs, I tell people to ask, and if they would do this on a regular basis, both managers and employees, eight magic words, are you getting what you need from me? And uh, can you imagine if you asked that on a regular basis and you had honest and open dialogue I think it would bring offices and businesses to the next level. Right. So, Kristen, let's transition. Let's, uh, we've got some solutions for our listeners. Uh, if you've stuck it out, you get rewarded. Um, <laughs> Yay. So I will go through and maybe I'll cover some of these and you cover some of these, but I'm going to read them first. It's kind of an acronym. Now, this is in a situation when you have that horrible boss that's just really breathing down your neck, so to speak. Um, you need to express yourself, separate yourself, protect yourself, promote yourself, and pamper yourself. 
So the first one is express yourself, and, and I will go into that. I think we would all agree, and I think, Chris, and you have a saying. What is it? Um, vent up? I, I, yes, I love that. Yes. Um, so I always respected an employee who disagreed with me if they would come to my office and we have an honest discussion about how they feel. And I think what happens is is a lot of times we're so tempted to go talk to everyone else except the boss. Only you know your boss. Only you know if there's someone that you can have a conversation with. But I would tell you the highest form of conversation and communication is to express yourself. Talk to the boss in a respectful way and tell that person how they're making you feel and try to see if you can get that situation rectified. Uh, it'll go yes. a long ways, I think. The next one is separate yourself. You got anything on that, Kristen? Yeah, definitely. You need to have a healthy work-life balance. And this goes back to when I discussed emails going out at midnight, one in the morning, weekends. You need to be able to go home and have a set time. Say you go home at six. Say you work from home. You have to shut the laptop and have a life outside of work. And you need to have hobbies that you do outside of work, exercise, whatever it is. You need to separate yourself. You need to have a life. And that is what your family needs from you also. You know, I use a term also, mental vacations. Even if you have a 15-minute break, take a break. Yes. Imagine you're on an exotic vacation. Do whatever you have to do, but you got to separate yourself from that because it's going to eat you up. And uh, ultimately, you're going to be burned out. It's going to affect you, your family, everyone that you care about. And it's, it's a terrible situation. Now, we acknowledge the bad situation that you may be in. We're not saying that. But try to take care of yourself. The next one right. is protect yourself. I'll speak to this a little bit. But uh, it's the OCYA acronym. Um, you do want to cover <laughs> yourself. So don't tr do things that's going to get you fired. If you think that your boss is micromanaging you or giving you a hard time or maybe looking for a reason to get rid of you, you want to cover yourself. Know your policies, your procedures. Don't color too far outside the lines. And this is going to pass. But for the time being, uh, do your absolute best and, and cover yourself. Don't give them a reason or an excuse. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, and also know the U.S. Constitution. Know your constitutional <laughs> That's rights. That's exactly right. There's my shameless yeah. plug. Uh, prom <laughs> promote yourself. Um, this is not, I'm not talking about bragging here, but sometimes it's okay to say, I finished that this morning, or I'm finished with that project. Or you show that you've documented something that you did, because a lot of times these insecure managers, they just need to know that you know your stuff and you know you're working hard. Uh, and you're not just some easy target, someone that they can pick on. You stand up for yourself, and that's what you do by promoting yourself sometimes. Again, you don't want to be a braggart and do it all the time, but it's okay to state your work or show that you're doing your work. I'll tell you what. Right, right. The last one is pamper yourself. Would you like to take that one, Kristen? Yeah, I will. And I think that there's a connotation that goes along with pamper that men think it's only for women. And it's not. To pamper yourself, you're you're just being nice to yourself. You're allowed to go get a massage, to go get a pedicure, a manicure. You're allowed to do things um, that is good for your mind, body, and soul. And that, that sounds very Portland of me, but it, it's true. You need to be kind to yourself, show yourself grace. And it's not only mentally, it's physically as well. I love that. I, I'm being honest here. I, I struggled with that and I'm doing better, but um, I was in a very strict martial art, and I, I think I saw pampering as, as weakness, but I started realizing if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of others. And uh, so I am trying to do better in, in that regard. It was just never part of the way I grew up or uh, the way I did right. things. Now, I would watch TV, things like that, but I'm talking about really replenishing myself. And uh, again, yeah. that's that's some areas that, that I'm working on. As a matter of fact, I'm going to end this podcast and go get a pedicure now while I'm thinking about it. <laughs> hey, 
And men, you can get one without nail polish. You can, <laughs> I'm like, good a lot of people, I, I honestly, a lot of dudes don't realize that. Good to know, Ron. Ron's been getting them with nail polish, yeah. but um, you, you can just have them buff Thank you for nail. telling me, is it cheaper? Because if it's a package deal, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting, you're gonna save listen, me. <laughs> I'm too cheap. I'm getting the whole thing if, if, if it's the same price. Um, <laughs> Do it. So, oh. Kristen, how can people keep up with us on this podcast journey? Yes. So we are on Facebook. We are on Instagram, LinkedIn. We have the groups, as you mentioned earlier, set up on LinkedIn and on Facebook, those interactive groups. On Instagram, you can DM us. We want to talk to you. Anywhere you are at, you can find us. And when you are going to get your podcasts, we are going to be found wherever podcasts are available. So look us up. Please subscribe, like, share, promote us, share with your friends, tag them at a spot. Maybe it's 20 minutes in that you think would really resonate with somebody. That goes a long ways and it would really help us out in our journey. Absolutely. And uh, we have a, a very long email if you want to email us. It's Ron and Kristen at <laughs> dirtysideofleadership.com. Um, so the first episode, Kristen, how do you feel? I feel good. I feel good. Outside of the IT issues with getting set up, I think that might put me in an early grave. But now I think we're good to go. We're golden for the future. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you guys only got to, you know, see this episode. I'm glad you couldn't see us a couple of hours ago. Um, <laughs> it was it was quite interesting. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. So Chris and I always end my post this way. So I would love to end the podcast this way. And that is... Be the leader you're meant to be. Yep. All right, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you next week on the Dirty Side of Leadership podcast. The Dirty Side of Leadership podcast is brought to you by Forward Operations. If you'd like to book Ron or Kristen for speaking events, training, or executive coaching, visit forwardoperations.com. Be the leader you're meant to be.